count how many clicks that. Yeah, that's right. You're smarter than I think you're smarter. <laughs> now, no, you have to understand that the truth of the matter is to say, um, I'm a total fraud, and I've made my entire career uh, by being a class and not being able to use computers. And the leap of genius, such as it is, is that I actually was able to turn that into the future by saying it wasn't my fault when playing the computer. <laughs> And then the next step was, and by the way, here's how to fix it. But um, I determined never to learn how to use computers and make them come to me instead of me to them. It's like you on a dog. Um, and I should say, it's kind of true. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's this skepticism in action. Uh, it's, this is skeptic and the, the cyber flow balance of the cyber flow. So I want to talk about ecosystems because actually that's what this comes about. We're surrounded by all these technologies and there's uh, certain issues here that uh, speaking about things that don't work. So, um, I want to talk about these ecosystems in which we undertake design, but also in which we live when we're working with these technology-based products. And there's this whole area that people talk about design thinking and uh, it's a very trendy topic right now. If you want to get successful in business and business strategy, you can start talking about design thinking. I think it's a, a article this month's Harvard Business Review explaining it all, which I read and I didn't recognize much in it. Um, and the challenge when you're trying to think about these things, so it's, it's not just how designers think, but also what is design thinking but also what designers know, what, what do they know, where's the knowledge? And if you go through, I, I actually literally bought every book in the bibliography of my book, and I actually went through all of them. It falls probably about three or four linear meters of book space, about books on design theory, design thinking, and, and so on, and design process. And the reality is, it's really thin going. And it's really painful. And part of it, I realized as I went along, is because when people think about thinking, they have this pretty old way of, this old notion in terms of understanding of thought, and that is the notion that thought takes place in the head. And, and nearly all of the work on design theory and uh, design um, research and design thinking is based on that kind of premise. So then, and so you've got lots of diagrams and arrows about designers do this and that. And you'll never see anything that the people who wrote those books ever designed using those things because I think nobody ever did design the way the books tell you. But what I do know is that from cognitive science, that thinking and knowledge is not in the head. And um, the place where this was most well articulated the best was in this book by Ed Hutchins uh, called Commission in the Wild. And what I think is pretty interesting about it, what he did is he studied, and this is the reason for the images on the right side there about a ship's uh, bridge, is he studied navigation and this whole notion that the tools, the maps, um, the, the organizational structures of the crew on the bridge and so on, that the knowledge of navigation was mapped into that whole larger social and spatial technological ecosystem. And, 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 and I think that any approach to talking about design that doesn't talk about that all aspects, the physical ecosystem and the social ecosystem, probably is, 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 is doomed to failure. And the challenge is, is that for those of us who are business and companies, maybe we're engineers, maybe we're, we're industrial designers, maybe we're computer scientists, maybe we're psychologists, well, the psychologists, they, they know this. But the rest of us, whatever we do, if we're any good at it, it was a full-time job to get good at it. Right? The things we're dealing with are not trivial. They're hard. They take specialized. So I'm never going to complain that you don't understand design, or you don't understand music, or you don't understand these things. Because if you're good at what you did, you did that. You, you pay the price for that. I have the appearance of being good at what I do, but you have no idea that all of the things I neglected amongst my family and every other things I shouldn't have, like my makeup packs and <laughs> something like that, that I neglected in order to be good at this thing, to the extent that I am good at this. And, and, and everybody's like that. So if you understand it, there's huge gaps hidden behind the facade of success of people who are good at things. 
Now, there's freaks of nature, right, that are just good at everything. But forget them because, you know, they just chose the parents right and something, something <laughs> way them up. You can't reproduce it. So I'm only interested in design and processes and thoughts that we can teach, we can learn, and they're reproducible. And that's why I have no interest in, in uh, studying people who had a great idea and built a billion dollar company on it if they've just that one. It's like, why would you study music for somebody who's a one day wonder, no matter how successful? It's the repeat offenders that I care about, and in that sense. And so, when I look at different professions and different things, the one thing that keeps coming up is that knowledge is distributed in the physical world now. And it's not a surprise, because we all know philosophy 101, right? Thought without language, you're coming to language without thought. You know, thought, thought without language, notations are full of thought. All of these different things are basically representation is a key part of thinking. And the tools and objects and notations, whether physical, conceptual, or, or notational in that sense, are part of that. And, and, and so let's talk about that. And, 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 and to do so, I want to start by saying, why bother? Why do we care? Why should we bother engaging in this conversation? Because after all, you know, we all went to school, we got good at what we do, and, and why don't we just keep on doing it? And the reason is, is because we are failing collectively, not individually, but collectively, we're failing miserably. And, the, and that, furthermore, the issues at stake are getting more and more serious. And, and somehow we have to, sit at, a, at the systemic level, in terms of our educational programs, in terms of how we run our companies, in terms of how we, we operate just as individuals or as groups, we have to change it or we're just going to continue to do worse and we can't afford to. And especially um, if you, know, you care about sustaining some degree of quality of life and the standard of living and so on. Now, the reason I got concerned about this is because of something that when I was at Xerox Park was involved in this whole evolution of the ubiquitous computing. And so on. the notion that microprocessors are embedded in almost everything we, we use. The population of microprocessors in the world today is something like 10 times the population of Earth of people. Um, and, the, and the more we're there, the worse things are going to get. Not because technology is bad, but because our, we're bad at managing how we think about it and how we decide. And I'd argue that one of the things that causes that problem is the fact that as they began, they were primarily technological challenges that we had to overcome, and therefore they were overcome by technologists. And somewhere along the line, these technologies went mainstream. Remember, when computer science began, the people who used computers were the people who built them. They were for ourselves. And despite everybody here saying, hey, computers are changing a mile a minute, technology's gone really fast, but it's unmitigated nonsense that's totally superficial that change you perceive. The architecture of a von Neumann engine is exactly the same now. If you draw the address register, the memory register, the data bus, the address bus, and so on, the architectures are essentially unchanged since the huge refrigerator size things we all used to use. They've got smaller, faster, cheaper, and there's more of them. But the most important thing that's changed is who's using them, where they're using them, what they're using them for, and for how much they're using them. So Sarah's fly sitting there. She started with one of the co-founders of a project called Media Space at Xerox Park somewhere around 1985, if I remember correctly. Desktop communication. In fact, it has a really strong root here in Portland. They had an office here, a satellite office at Xerox Park here. Uh, the offices were around the outside in a horseshoe shape with a common area in the middle. A big video monitor on the blank wall where there were no offices. There was a mirror image of that in Palo Alto. Against that wall, there was a great honking big rear projection TV. Now, things like you all have in your living room now, but in those days, I've never seen one before. And they had a T1 line, which is a really fast data line that cost thousands of dollars. I mean, it probably cost $500 to $1,000 a day to keep that thing open, but it was over 24 hours a day. So that when I visited at Xerox Park, actually, I'm not telling you which park, I could call one of the doorbells and say, has anybody seen Sarah? And the answer 